Thank you. Um, I have, this is actually my 38th year at the same school. I can't get a job anywhere else, but uh, 38th year in an independent school in San Francisco. Uh, more about that in a moment. But first, a question for you. How many people, just raise your hand, in this audience are musicians? Let me take a peek. Wow. How many of you are musical? Mm -hmm. And how many of you like music? Uh-huh. So that was fairly predictable, although you're a little bit on the high range. But in a typical audience, maybe 10, 15 percent say, OK, I'm kind of a musician. And then 30, 35 percent, well, I guess I could sing happy birthday in tune. I'm a little bit musical. And then what do you think happens with the last question? Everybody. Uh, the first one is understandable. It takes a lot of work to be a musician. You need time, you need interest, you need to commit to it. So not everybody's going to claim that. The last one is amazing. That something that is uh, so neglected in the schools is so universally loved by everybody. But the one that really concerns me is the middle one, the one where maybe 30 to 40 percent, in this case it was more like 50 to 60 percent, people say, I am musical, and the rest of the people say, well, I don't think I am. And the question is, what happened? I tried this experiment at my school just yesterday. At my school, the kids start at three years old. They go to eighth grade. They have music almost every day for all 11 years, every child. No choice in the matter. And I asked them the same question. No setup. I just said, who here is a musician? Who here is musical? Who here is, loves music? And the answers were 100%, 100%, 100%. How do you think that made me feel? Quite good. Because it means that they have gotten something from the music program that is what they deserve, which is the chance to feel that they indeed are a musical being. Whether or not they go into it as a hobby or a profession doesn't matter. Just to feel that they are musical. What happened to what's happening to the 50, 70 percent that said, well, I'm not musical? And the chances are, well, for one thing, maybe they, they went to school in California, where there hasn't been music in a really serious way in, in, in many parts of California for some 35 years because of some very bad idea called Proposition 13 all those years ago. So we have a whole generation, several generations of children have grown up with no music in the schools. Or they had music in the school, or they had music lesson outside of school, and it didn't touch the musician that they are. Uh, that's another problem that, that we'll get into. So the next question is, how many people here would like to be musical? How many people would like to feel musical? So if you didn't raise your hand before, maybe you would say yes. And here's the most important question. How many people would like their children to be musical? Your existing children, your future children, and uh, hard to see out here, but I think just about everybody, and of course that's the way I would hope it would be, because music offers something to children and adults and that is indispensable. Uh, it appears to be dispensable because we appear to be without it, but really nobody is without it. They're just with, with it in different ways. They're with it as a consumer, as the iPod listener, as the person paying tickets to go to the beautiful theater, but they're not in it from the inside yet. What would it take for them to feel that from the inside? One of the difficult things about my profession as music educator is that uh, people have very strange notions about what music is so, uh, and what education and what music education is. Uh, the first strange notion is that music is something that some people have and some people don't. It's an inboard talent. You got it or you don't have it. If you don't have it, you pay the tickets, you buy the iPod. If you have it, good luck, right? But uh, everything we know about brain research, everything I know about my life's work uh, shows that that's completely wrong. Every person on the planet, every person in this theater is a musical being. You're musical in your body. You're, you have a breath rhythm, you have a heart rhythm, you have brain waves rhythm, you walk to a rhythm, you, you, you organize your day to a rhythm. You are immersed in music in your body, in your heart, in your mind. But um, it, until, for you to know that directly, it needs to be brought out. Everybody has this musical potential. Everybody has music as an intelligence. 
but it needs to meet experience before it's drawn out. And indeed, this is the root word of education from the Latin educare, which means to lead forth, to draw out that which we already have. So that's an essential idea uh, to correct the misconception that some people have it, some people don't. Everybody has it, you have it. Even I have it, even my mother has it. Secondly is um, you ask people, um, what do you need to teach music? Oh, well, you need to teach people how to read notes and play an instrument, right? And that's a very strange notion. That is a part of music, but it's a very small part. Really, again, if you think of la music not only as an intelligence and as a bodily phenomena, but as a language, then you know that everybody has the capability to speak music. We're genetically wired that way. Our brains are programmed to receive this kind of musical uh, education. But again, we have to learn it in the right way. And the right way is to learn music the way we learned to speak, which was we did not take speaking lessons as a baby and go through book number one and book number two. We were immersed in the bath of language and we absorbed it in a very organic kind of natural way. And the same thing is true of music. I travel around the world. I've, taught, I've done this work in some 40 countries worldwide and I've never met a non-musical being in any culture, but I've met extraordinary musical children in cultures where music is not a separate thing off to the side, but is just the way that people live every day. And if you tell them you're a music teacher, they say, what do you mean? I, I don't understand. That's like being a breathing teacher or a talking teacher. And then I have to say, well, we have those two, you know. But, uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> But, but when, when we teach music in this organic, natural way as a language, then we understand that you don't begin with a symbol, you begin with a sound. You don't begin with reading notes, you begin with singing. You don't begin with this idea that, um, of uh, playing the instrument first. You learn all the music here, and then it comes onto the instrument from there. And this is a radically different uh, experience of music uh, that is proven to work quite well. The approach that I use is called the Orff approach, developed by this uh, man, Carl Orff, and this is the, the basis of his old idea, a very organic, natural way of teaching. Uh, and then a third thing is, when should children learn music? Well, if you understand that they need to speak, and uh, as we've said, uh, then of course they need to learn it, um, well, in the womb is when it really begins. Uh, I see the children at three years old, that's a little late, but it's not too late. But the most important years, and all brain research is supporting this, is the first eight or nine years of life when the brain is, is wired. Uh, any potential in the brain that doesn't meet the right experience, um, it can be lost, use it or lose it. But it's not lost forever because the brain is quite plastic and there's still hope. Even well, when I do workshops for adults, I say, you know, it's never too late to have a happy childhood. Um, my student Carolina came quite late to my school. She came in sixth grade. And in sixth grade, it's, it's pretty late. And, um, but she was there for three years and at the end she said this. I learned to play jazz, which is really, really cool because I thought I couldn't play anything. I, I always thought that you can't learn music, but being in your class changed my mind. And she discovered, indeed, she could. And many adults discover that as well. So now the question is, how do you convince the school boards that this is important? And instead of just saying, well, it's important that kids know how to play Bach and Charlie Parker, which of course I think it is, uh, more importantly is what do children get from the experience of music? Uh, I'll give you three things. Number one, discipline. Uh, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? You practice. That's the only way to have success in music or in anything. A kid who is involved in a discipline is a kid who understands how you make progress. They can track their progress. They can see their achievement. They can have their days connected with this thread, with this dot of I started here, I'm ending up here. And uh, kids who have that kind of inner discipline also often don't need that kind of outer discipline that, that we struggle with so much with uh, youth at risk. Uh, another, number two is power. Power is a big thing. You know when you press the computer button and it doesn't work? How do you feel? You're enraged, <laughs> you know, you have no control over it. But with music, you have the power to, to get that vibrato from a string, to bend that blues note. You have the power to, to balance your hands in the Mozart sonata. Uh, you have this inner power and we're literally with music putting the power 
in the children's hands. That's a huge one. Otherwise, of course, children are, feel very powerless and they, they're dealing with superheroes and video games and temper tantrums as a way to show their, their sense of power, but music gives them the right sense. And finally, the third one is belonging, because we all need to belong and we all have that deep, deep urge to belong. But the belonging in the best way, where we don't just belong just and do whatever is required to be in the club, we belong and we want to feel valued. We want to feel we're contributing to the club. And that's music. Whether you're playing the first violin or the last triangle, you are playing something essential to the group sound. And when that thing works, then you belong in a huge way, which is your voice is immersed in this larger voice in this choir. And, and your, your drumming gets lost inside the thundering of all the drums. Your dance gets just, uh, becomes part of this large creature. And so you belong to something so much larger to yourself, which is something, of course, we all have this urge for. Now, I've heard it said that no kid in a uh, jail or in a gang has ever been in a band. And what they're saying is that a kid who is not given the things that they need from a culture, from their family, from the school, from the surrounding culture, has to find it because we all have these urges that are so crucial to belong, to feel power, to, to feel discipline. So these kids are getting it in the wrong way. They're apprenticing themselves to violence. They're belonging to a gang of peers and they're being known through uh, you know, guns and knives. That's, how the, that's where they're feeling their power. Uh, what would it be like if you took youth at risk and instead of arming them with vi violence, you armed them with violins, right? And this is exactly what Jose Abreu down in Venezuela did with his thing called El Sistema. And he has taken youth at risk and through the power of music has transformed some 400,000 lives. Uh, this works. There, there's, this is not theory. This is not conjecture. This really works. So uh, all those things are... Um, the right impulses, the gang member has the right impulses, but the wrong container. Music is the right container. And by the way, there's other containers. Sports is pretty good for discipline, for power, right? For control and for belonging. But there's one thing that music offers that, uh, that nothing else does in quite the same way. And it might be a surprising word to hear in schools, and it's beauty. We all hunger for beauty, children as well as adults. And if you need to be convinced, come with me when I go play piano with my mother. There she is in the middle. Look at that expression on her face. And see what that means to her. When I come into that home, all the wheelchairs start rolling towards the piano like, like wildlife to the water hole in a drought. You know, they want to drink from that fount of music, and they do. And they leave refreshed. Come with me when I'm singing a lullaby to my one-year-old granddaughter, Zadie. See how much music means to her. Come to the workshops with the adults that I teach and see what it's like when they discover that, hey, I am musical. And finally, come see the children. Look how happy these children are in their classes as we play, sing, and dance our way through the day. So uh, I'm trying to be convincing with my words, but all you really have to do is ask the kids who have had these experiences what it means to them, and you'll find these wise children. Here's two of them. We'll close with Morgan. Can we have the next slide? This is Morgan Cundiff, seventh grader. Music is very important to me. Why? Because it can fill in your blanks. It's flexible the way that you are. You can always find music that fits your mood. And you know that saying, misery loves company? Well, music makes you feel there's someone else out there who feels the same way that you do. It shares your pain, it builds your spirits, it fills those bare silences. It's like a colorful emotion that spreads over the room whenever it's played. Everyone should be allowed or able to feel that color, that emotion, as it flows through them. And finally, Jackson Van Fleet Brown said, music isn't just notes written on paper. It isn't different frequencies. It isn't a thing at all. Music is a way of life. You can live through music. You can feed on it. You can find relief in it. I use music as a passage. And that passage can go wherever I want it to. Jazz, classical, rock and roll, they're all different passageways of music. It brings you to a new dimension. Maybe it's an A-flat dimension or a techno dimension. Whatever that dimension is, it's the one you want and it's the one you need. 
It's the one we all want. It's the one we all need. It's the one children want. It's the one children need. It's the one your children want and your children need. My advice, let's give it to them. Thank you.